O Lord, save thy people and bless thine inheritance, granting Hello, Damsi. I am Bishop Nicholas of the Diocese of Miami in the Southeast. Welcome to the video project, Bless Thine Inheritance, that documents the history of Damsi. This history finds its roots in early 20th century, when St. Raphael himself founded St. George Church in Vicksburg, Mississippi, the oldest church in the diocese. This project is being led by Shemassi Shalkheim of All Saints Church, Raleigh, North Carolina, Elias Abu Ghazali, St. George Orlando, Gabby Bleem, St. Andrews, Pensacola, Florida and Scott Strickland of St. Nicholas Church, Springdale, Arkansas, who is a graphic designer, and he put together this video. The documentary video is a contribution of many, if not all the parishes in the diocese. It contains pictures and actual videos that show when the parishes started and how we have progressed until now. The name of the game is Constant Progress that will continue until the second come. Please enjoy. Our father among the saints, Raphael Hawawini, Bishop of Brooklyn, was the first Orthodox Christian bishop consecrated on American soil. Traveling throughout the continent in the first years of the 20th century, he founded 30 parishes in North America. Two years after his consecration as bishop in 1904, he founded St. George Antiochian Orthodox Church in Vicksburg, Mississippi. In 2006, St. George celebrated its 100th anniversary as the oldest Antiochian Orthodox Church in the Diocese of Miami and the Southeast. From there, the story continues. St. Elias in 1921, St. George Cathedral in 1953, the expansion of parishes throughout Florida and the southern states. Courageous groups of people faced up to the challenges of being in a new country and formed tightly knit communities. They worked hard and steadfastly stuck together. Each community made every sacrifice necessary to acquire their own house of worship. The hardships and sacrifices were many, but the expression of their faith grew like wildfire. Throughout the 1970s, 1980s, and 1990s, parishes continued to grow rapidly, welcoming converts in great numbers. The 2000s saw continued Domsey growth westward. By 2020, Domsey includes 41 parishes, including several missions across nine states. May God look down from heaven and behold and perfect that which thy right hand hath planted. Good afternoon, my name is Father John Himati. I'm the pastor of St. George Orthodox Church in Orlando, Florida. And my title is Father. I am Father Nicholas Sorensen. I am the founding priest and senior priest of All Saints Orthodox Church, the former director of missions for the diocese, and also currently the dean of the Southeastern Deanery for the clergy. I am Father Kamal ar rahim the pastor of St. George Antiochian Orthodox Church in Jacksonville, Florida. This is Father Andrew Moore, Priya Danny Moore. We're at St. Stephen Church in Hiram, Georgia. This is Father John Oliver from St. Elizabeth Church in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, in the Diocese of Miami in the Southeast. I'm Father Philip Begley, Senior Pastor here at St. Ignatius. And I'm Deacon Edward here at St. Ignatius, one, one of six deacons. Hello, Father Gabriel, St. Elias in Atlanta, Georgia. I am Prodeacon Deacon David Keim from All Saints Orthodox Church in Raleigh, North Carolina. I'm Father Elia. Shalom, uh, Pastor of St. Uh, Anthony the Great in Melbourne and Dean of South Florida Antiochian Deanery for the last 25 years. Uh, and my title that was uh, bestowed on me by His Grace of 
Christ's blessed memory, Bishop Antoine, the great economist of the Diocese of Miami. My name is Odette Rahbani Sharpu. Uh, my title is Kuriye. Oh, I'm Father Stephen DeYoung of uh, Archangel Gabriel Orthodox Church in Lafayette, Louisiana. I'm Father Hans Jacob C. Priest at St. Peter the Apostle Orthodox Church in Bonita Springs, Florida. I'm Father Peter Sporton, the friendly Orthodox priest of St. Mary Orthodox Church in West Palm Beach, Florida. My name is Father David Bleem. I am the pastor of St. Andrew the Apostle in Pensacola, Florida. I am Father John Henderson, pastor of St. Peter Antiochian Orthodox Church in Madison, Mississippi. I'm also the dean of the Lower Mississippi Valley Deanery, uh, which is one of four deaneries in the Diocese of Miami in the Southeast. Hi, my name is Father Peter Nugent. I'm the pastor at St. Basil Antiochian Orthodox Church in Metairie, Louisiana, a, a suburb of New Orleans. I'm Father Philip Rogers, pastor of St. John in Memphis, Tennessee, and the spiritual advisor for our diocese, Teen Soyo. The person that comes to mind, of course, is Bishop Antoon. He was my bishop for the vast majority of the time that I've spent here in the district, in the, uh, in the diocese. You see, I said district because I remember it as the district of the Fellowship of St. John the Divine. But it was Bishop Antoon for most of those years that I knew, and he had some very interesting traits that endeared him to, to me and to the people here at All Saints. One of the things that he was often doing would, was to yell at the priests for something that they did. And as a new priest, I was very scared about that at first. And uh, the first time it actually happened, he yelled, and then about five minutes later, he gave me a big hug and he said, oh, Habibi, it's okay, don't worry. <laughs> so but you, you knew where you stood with Bishop Antu. He was a, a, a man that would say it the way it is, and yet he loved you and you knew that. He was also a, a grandfather figure for most of our children here at All Saints. So uh, a wonderful bishop. Let me start with uh, my dear, dear, beloved Sayyidina Antun. Uh, Sayyidina Antun, for those of us that knew him in his younger years, always spoke at a very high volume. And when he was upset, the volume went even higher. And I have always used a microphone uh, at our parish, but I know that when Sayyidina came, he never would use a microphone because he didn't need a microphone. And um, there, there are so many uh, interesting and funny stories about uh, Bishop Antun, but one that is on a more serious note was because it wasn't always easy to get to know Sayyidina Antun or what motivated him. And I remember after a Parish Life conference uh, here in the diocese that I went up to him, I had heard him speaking about some subjects, and I went up to him and I said to him, now I understand you. And he said, really? I said, this is who you are, Sayyidina. You are the one that goes the straight way. And he said, you're right, I am. Um, I, I really uh, could become emotional even talking about Bishop Antun now. Uh, because he's very, very dear to me, and I, I pray his soul rest in peace. Saints, I'm sure that it does. Uh, the late uh, beloved Bishop Anton, he was very dear to my heart because he loved this diocese. He works from all his heart to see it grow spiritually and um, to be represented in very well in the archdiocese. He was so compassionate, um, loving, he never failed to tell us how much he loved us, how much he cared for us, and he did trust us. He charged us, he gave us responsibilities, clergy and uh, laity, um, and he held us accountable. Like he give you some things, you have to do it. My memory of him as being, he's a strict leader, but also he was a, a, a it has a heart of a child filled with essence of innocence and love.
since I was the right hand, you know, his right hand in running the diocese. Uh, I mean, he would call on me, you know, if he gets any calls from clergy and uh, he didn't have time, you know, to answer their calls, he would refer them to me, you know, to, to answer, you know, uh, the calls. I mean, his patience, his love to the diocese was a great example, you know, for, for us all. Not long before his repose, uh, we had sent Bishop Antoon uh, a little gift from the church, just a love gift. We knew he had been quite ill for quite, quite a time. Although usually uh, every Christmas and every Thanksgiving, I believe, we would send him in Metropolitan Philip uh, usually a tin of pecans, and they always uh, enjoyed those, sometimes the pecan pie. Metropolitan Phillips said one time he loved the pecan pies, so we would send them all. But on this occasion, uh, I would say weeks before he departed, uh, Bishop Ann, we sent him a little gift, and Bishop Antoon called me on the phone, and he said, uh, I was sitting here thinking about my life, and I just didn't know. And then this card came in the mail and had this gift. And he just talked about how much that meant to him. Uh, so what a blessing it was to us, as he was also to us. And to our children. He loved our children. And he was like a grandfather to our six children. And we will always remember him for that. Mm -hmm. okay. One time he was here, and he, uh, my mother at that time was living, and she asked him in a meeting, uh, I think it was a ladies' meeting they were having, when he always, remember Bishop Anthony would always say, do you have any questions? Do you have any questions? So she raised her hand and she said, uh, well, my son, is a priest here. I don't know what to call him. She said, what should I call him? And Bishop Antoon, with his little smile, said, Mary, you call him anything you want to. <laughs> uh, so we remember so many of those times. I remember very fondly uh, hearing uh, Bishop Antoon say the word Mississippi, or talking about catfish and how he loves catfish. And perhaps one of my most cherished memories of, of Bishop Antoon even was uh, when he came to our church in uh, Lexington, St. Barnabas, he saw a teddy bear uh, that had a collar on it and he went up to it and laughed and he said, this is an icon of me. But when I was a priest in Atlanta, Georgia, he would come and frequently visit and he'd have me, or at the time my deacon, Ken McMillan, take him to some of the churches in the Carolinas. And as we would drive, he would read the, the signs on the road. He would read, Paul DeBot, or he would read, Stuckies, Georgia Pecans. Then he would ask me, what is a pecan? And he would read, all the billboards and all the signs. And I realized that there was a, a motive to him, his doing this. And finally, after about an hour and a half, I pulled over to the side of the road and I said to him, Sandra, would you like to drive? He goes, sure. We switched places, he drove, and not another word from him for the next hour and a half, two hours. And now, here we are, 2020, and we have the Diocese of Miami in the Southeast, which is flourishing under the stewardship of Bishop Nicholas. He's been very, very kind with the children and with the people, and I think he's gonna be accepted in the same way that Bishop Antoon was. As we remember the past, we also look towards the future. His Grace Bishop Nicholas was consecrated to the bishopric as the Bishop of Brooklyn on December 11th, 2011 at the Church of the Dormition of the Theotokos in the Patriarchal Monastery of Our Lady of Balamond in Balamond, Lebanon. He was one of three bishops consecrated on December 11th, 2011 
as assistant bishops for the Antiochian Orthodox Christian Archdiocese of North America. His grace has led the Diocese of Miami and the Southeast by combining ancient wisdom with modern application. His tirelessness, use of technology, and pastoral care have been an example for us all. Syedna speaks often about the opportunity for the faithful to become godlike and the importance of a spiritual father or mother. Many years to our master and shepherd of the flock. As you may know, three years ago, when I became the bishop of this diocese, I articulated the mission and vision for Domsey. The top goal for all Domseyans is really nothing new. It is becoming godlike as orthodoxy teaches. I have been preaching and teaching this top goal at every parish visit for the past three years. It is taking deep root in the minds of the faithful. It is acquiring the virtues that are the attributes of God, like agape love, which is an action rather than a feeling, kindness rather than being nice, self-control, humility, goodness, gratitude, etc. The stop goal may take a lifetime for some or much shorter for others, depending on our attitude, devotion, focus, perseverance, and our prayers for God to help us in this task. Everything else we do at this diocese must lead to this top goal. This needs to be in the forefront of our minds as we spend our days at work, home, or elsewhere. God bless you. The person that always stood up to me that all those are fine priests, most of them are retired now. Um, I love all of them, but I'm going to mention just one person for the sake of the interview, Father Andrew Moore and his beloved wife, Hori Danny Moore. Um, I saw them how they work for the diocese with love and compassion, and they encourage everybody around them. So those are, and she was, she was with the ladies, he was with the, with the clergy, um, and I see how the, the ladies and the clergy and the fellowship are working. His whole family, Father Andrew Moore, was involved in all organization. Um, like nowadays, we do have uh, Archdeacon uh, David Kime and his wife, Shemesi Shell, and all of them are very involved and they work for the diocese. Those people are serious about the spiritual growth of the diocese and how they work and they offer from their time. They find time to do that. Those they impacted. My, they, I mean, they they had they left a big impression on me. Make me to work harder because I love them and I see. I like people when they are very serious about their faith. I love it. I love it. My dear friend, Father Moore, up in Hiram, Georgia has always had a very definite spiritual effect on me because he's one of the most humble people, nice person, sincere person, uh, very loves the Orthodox Church very dearly. And I, I would say that uh, he has had a, a very definite uh, effect on me. We've, we've met so many people across this diocese, as we mentioned earlier. People who grew up in the Orthodox Church, some who converted to the church later, but people who have just been so wonderful, both in the love and the acceptance and also the wisdom they had over the years. Danny remembers a few of them personally. I do because looking back at the parish life conferences from several years past, that was one of the uh, main events is to go there and meet with our friends that we had become um, close to. I think about them today I, and um, I miss them, but we've grown to love other people and we hold those people in our hearts too that are in the diocese now. And um, we have loved the church, we do love the church, we love our diocese. 
but I would mention, you know, uh, Father Gordon Walker, uh, who was, you know, in Tennessee and Franklin, Tennessee. He was to me like an icon, the example of a priest, you know, who, especially those who converted and became Orthodox, you know, he was really a true figure. Father Gordon Walker, also of thrice blessed memory, used to refer to our churches as outposts of the kingdom of God in a foreign land. I've always loved uh, that, that terminology because our churches should be places of refuge, places of warmth, where we can come in out of the cold that, that, wor that is that world out there. Something that I've had that has st stood out for me really has to do with my brother clergy and I have so much that I can learn from them. The person who's had the most impact on me spiritually and in our travels and our experiences in this diocese uh, has been Korea Dan. Uh, for two reasons. One is I have seen in her such a love for the church. She made sure every week there were fathers in the church. She made sure that everything was in order. And from time to time, she would say, we need to get that icon, or we, we need this. The chandelier above us is because she said, we need to have a chandelier. And she's always been amongst those who love the beauty of God's house. Secondly, she had a great impact in my life in that she had a great love for the diocese. And she said, we've got to be mindful of the wider church. And so it was that she served in the diocese for many, many years in the Antiochian women and held numbers of offices, both in the diocesan level and in the national, in the NAB, the archdiocesan level. North American Board, thank you. Uh, and I'd like for her to just say a word about that. Well, um, I did not know he was going to say that. And of course, he has had the greatest impact on my life. And I guess we've impacted each other with our lives because we've been married for 60 years now. And um, he's the best Bible teacher I've ever known. Um, I did I, I did get involved with Antiochian women early and I have loved every minute of that and my two daughters Lisa and Dana also became involved and I've always had friendship with those people those ladies they accepted me as a quote outsider but I became one of them and I have um, worked in to the glory of God, hopefully, to have our parish here involved in, in all the archdiocese. That was a goal. We, people would know who we are. And more importantly, that God would bless us and help us. You know, when we, when we met 44 years ago, she tried, but she didn't have any experiences about the priest's wife, what the priest's wife should be. She tried to change her my mind. She said, do you have to be a priest? I said, you know, I made my decision when I was 10 years old. I'm not gonna change my mind. So if you are willing to go through this with me, you know, we'll stay on. If not, and thank God she made that choice. You know, I really can't thank with blind eyes. <laughs> can't thank her enough for, for the sacrifice. I mean, no, you know, people, they don't realize how much the peace wife really sacrificed in her life. For the many years that I've experienced life in the Diocese of Miami and the Southeast, Domsey, uh, that experience has been marked, thankfully, by the witness of so many good and faithful priests and so many good and faithful people throughout the course of the entire diocese 
Throughout all of my life, there's always been uh, someone to look up to and someone to attempt to emulate, uh, whether that be the good and faithful priest or uh, just one of the, the faithful who are showing and shining their light in the different activities that our diocese continues to uh, come up with and continue to run. When I was a teen, uh, now Bishop Thomas, then Father Thomas Joseph in St. Petersburg, Florida, was the diocese spiritual advisor. And I remember very fondly him uh, singing fun songs and uh, attempting to, and most of the time succeeding, in standing on his head at a lot of our Teen Soyo uh, meetings uh, when we were there as teens. Back in the mid-90s, when I was a layman, I was invited to attend the Parish Life Conference of this diocese that year. And it was, I think, in Orlando. So I'm sitting in a business meeting, and the topic of conversation was which long distance phone carrier should be the carrier of choice for the diocesan chancery? Mundane, right? Not that big of a deal. Well, in this meeting was a broad collection of clergy, many born in the Middle East, some born here in America. As the conversation went on, it grew more and more animated, more and more passionate, more dramatic. Soon, some of the Middle Eastern clergy were standing from their tables, yelling at each other, passionate and dramatic, and speaking in Arabic, presumably because they didn't want the rest of us to understand what they were saying, and they seemed to be at each other's throats. Over a long-distance phone company? I thought I was watching the implosion of the diocese before my very eyes. Later that evening, I'm in the hotel lobby, and I look over in the bar, and there, huddled together, smoking cigars, back when you could do that kind of thing, drinking whatever, were all of these same Middle Eastern clergy. And they were laughing, and they were joking, and they were bursting into song, and slapping each other on the back, and they were just full of life and joy being with each other. Just when hours earlier, they seemed like they were worst enemies, now they seem like they were all best of friends. And I felt like I learned a valuable lesson that day about love and hospitality and about living a full life from the heart. So I thank this diocese for that and many other good lessons. I told uh, my brother priest many years ago that each of us should contribute uh, the most outrageous story in our ministry, of course uh, change the names to protect the clergy as well as the innocent, and we could put a book together and we would have such a book sale that we could probably pay off many of the, the debts of the parishes that now exist. When I was in seminary, I was asked in my final year where I thought I might end up going and where did I want to go, and I said I don't mind where I go as long as it's not down south. It is too hot. So, of course, I ended up down here, and God knows best. It's been wonderful for me and for my family. What do I want to be remembered from? I make very good tabbouleh, and I make very good kibbeneya. I remember a few years ago when I arrived here, Father Michael, my predecessor of 14 years, here at this parish gave me a tour of the church, handed me the keys and said, here it is, it's all yours. Patience, 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 <laughs> and love. You know, love and sacrifice goes the same direction. If we have love, if we have sacrifice, if we have patience, you know, everything, can be overcome. The foundation years predate the beginning of Dolpsy. In fact, they even predate the beginning years of, of the Southeast region. But they go back to the years of, of, of the Eastern region, which probably a lot of you do not remember. When I was young in the 1970s, I recall having to travel to places like Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and Bridgeport, Connecticut, and Allentown, Pennsylvania, to attend parish life conferences and, and delegates meetings as a member of St. George Orthodox Church in Jacksonville, Florida. 
Uh, back in the, in the early 70s, we were not blessed with all of the telephones that we have today. Uh, people had to find something else to distract them during church. But I do remember that uh, many people didn't even know there was an Antiochian Orthodox Church uh, in Central Florida at that time. And when we very first started here, there were only, I believe, three other churches uh, in Florida. There was St. George in Orlando, St. George Cathedral in Miami, St. Philip's in Davie, and uh, St. Mary's in West Palm Beach. And then uh, soon after uh, us came uh, St. George in Jacksonville. But what the day in the life of the church was, I think it's still the same for many, many clergy. I know that it's me. We are not just blessed to uh, do liturgical services and to minister sacraments to people but also there's the day-to-day -day running of the parish. And there are quite often times when all of us, all of my uh, brothers wear a different hat because it needs to be done. So in the sense of between then and now, the technology, believe it or not, has made things a little bit easier. Uh, if we get a very difficult theological question, when I get told phone, I get a very difficult theological question that I don't know the answer to, I can Google it while the person is on hold or such. So uh, there, there are many differences in that. But basically, the spiritual development of the parish, that means the people and the priest, is still the same as it was then. Since I served also as the camp director uh, for Camp St. Thecla for 10 summers, I have lots of fun memories of every staff member and every camper who ever came through there. Uh, here's looking at all of you for, for all of those beautiful years at, at camp. And uh, lots of fun memories with Father Leo Shelver uh, involving um, snakes and fish dances and fun uh, activities and moments like that. The one thing that I uh, was able to, maybe it's not an important thing to other people, but it's always made my heart feel good, is that when we talked about a name for the camp, uh, I was at that meeting and clergy were coming up with all different saints. And I remember I put up my hand, I said, well, how about Saint Thecla? I said, we don't have any women saints for any of the, our camps. And you know, there was there was some pushback against that, but I was, I'm sorry to say, I was dogged about it. I said, I really think, I've been to uh, Malu, Lu, not, yeah, Malula in Syria, I've been to the uh, convent of St. Tekla, and I was really, uh, I guess I was being obnoxious, but I wanted it to be St. Tekla, so thank God uh, that that happened, because I think it has been a, a beautiful name uh, for a beautiful camp. I think it was uh, a, great step forward, uh, you know, with the vision that God bless his soul, his eminence with Paul and Philip of Christ's best memory, had, you know, for the whole Archdiocese. Uh, you know, since the Archdiocese was growing uh, fast, is to have our local bishops, you know, uh, in the diocese. Metropolitan Philip in his wisdom saw the need to have another region, and he added the Southeast region. To be quite frank, I remember when we were the Eastern region uh, of the diocese before we had diocese. And many, many years ago, back in the late 70s and early 80s, I had recommended that we divide up uh, the archdiocese into uh, what I would say really, not diocese, but more like a Southeast region instead of Eastern region. Eventually that happened and there was a Southeast region uh, split off from Eastern region. So the idea that we would further go down the line to having diocese, I thought was very good and I was very happy to be, to be part of that. I think we have come uh, a long way, you know, uh, uh, in the last few years, especially you know, since his grace, Bishop Nicholas, uh, became our bishop that definitely, you know, he's a young bishop, he's on the go, he's uh, uh, making things happen and activities and retreats and uh, uh, meetings, you know, the, the formation of uh, Amen. I don't know what our DNA is, but I will tell you this. I was under the mistaken impression when I first started to hear about Amen that this was an archdiocesan-wide movement. It is not. It is something that His Grace Bishop Nicholas has come up with, and it is absolutely brilliant. The Amen is maybe the crown jewel of showing that, that we are looking towards uh, the future. I have watched Bishop Nicholas uh, uh, since he took over the uh, shepherding of this diocese, and he's really ahead of the curve. He's on the cutting edge. He uses uh, technology. But I do see that Domsey is uh, going, going in the right direction. For the past three years, 
we have established crucial infrastructure elements in the diocese to allow it to grow in God's service. It is very important that every single parishioner participates in this growth. This growth needs to be, most importantly, spiritual, and everything else will fall into place as God showers the diocese with his graces in accordance with what Jesus said in Matthew 6.33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. For this reason, we have established administrative committees like the Diocesan Ministry Council, the DMC, to help me run the diocese, the Domsi Finance Committee, and the Camp St. Tecla Admin and Finance Committees. These admin infrastructure elements, among many others, have facilitated the creation of the spiritual infrastructure elements like the new annual clergy retreat, the new annual fall retreat, the new annual winter retreat, the new annual winter camp, reinvented the parish life conference to be more spiritual, expanded the summer camp, and more recently, for the past 11 months, during the pandemic, the weekly live streaming to the diocese of fellowshipping and Bible study. We also established first the Antiochian men organization. You see, the Antiochian women have been established and organized for decades. But the other half of the diocese and of the Orthodox world for that matter, the men were never organized, neither in this diocese nor in the Orthodox world. For this reason, I started the Antiochian men organization and set their top goal to become godlike. The Antiochian men have flourished for the past two years under the leadership of Michael Barclay of St. Nicholas Church, Springdale, Arkansas. They have a website, a YouTube channel, a monthly Bible study, and many, many other numerous accomplishments that are too many to mention here. But, if, if, but you can go to antiochianmen.org to see for yourself. The Antiochian women have flourished as well for the past three years under the leadership of Don Evancho and Shamasi Shalkine of All Saints Church. They have the new annual Great Lent Spiritual Retreat, the new Clergy Wives Ministry, and many, many other activities and accomplishments that are also too many to mention here. But you can see for yourself if you go to domc.org. The young adults have made great progress as well under the leadership of Suana Altar of All Saints. Again, you can go to the website of the diocese, domc.org, to see for yourself. The youth, including the teens, have blossomed in the past three years under multiple leaderships of Mini Black. Matthew Spencer of St. Elias, Atlanta, Georgia, and Gabby Bleem of St. Andrews, Pensacola, Florida. Most parishes have awesome numbers of active teens and active younger children. I know this because during my two visits a year to each parish, I hold retreats for them and encourage them to grow and prosper spiritually. It is an ongoing and energetic effort. It is worthy to say that participation in all of these new events has been record-breaking year over year, whether in person or virtually. The Sunday School Directors Committee and the Kids Club under the leadership of Anasira Farha of St. George Church, Jacksonville, Florida, has organized Christian education instructions superlatively. Of course, 
we do not want to forget the essential role that the Damsi clergy play in the spiritual stimulation of the diocese, whether as pastors or associate pastors or assistant pastors or deacons or spiritual fathers or spiritual advisors of organizations or leaders of camp. To them, I raise my hat as they fight the good fight. Being an engineer for nearly 20 years before I went into the ministry, I value the right use of technology, and we therefore have implemented that in all our activities, like the teens' cyber spring retreat for the last three years, the 2020 VLC, the Virtual Life Parish Conference, and the 2020 Virtual for Retreat. This effort of using technology like websites, the band app, Instagram, Facebook, and others will continue in the appropriate way for our ministry. Spirituality is here to stay as facilitated, facilitated by our organizations and countless faithful who donate their time generously and professionally to make Domsi successful. Please visit domsi.org and see for yourself all committees, organizations, and ministries and their boards who have contributed so vitally for the success of Domsi. God bless you. I think the first specific challenge that I faced being in this diocese was hosting the second annual fall retreat about a year ago. Uh, the first fall retreat was teen soil only. The second fall retreat was everybody, all the organizations, AW, AMEN, everybody. So to be the first ones to do this, there was no roadmap to follow. So we were just making it up as we were going along. So it was a great challenge for me to do that because I never hosted a retreat or a PLC as a pastor. This is my first time. So it really stretched me. How did I overcome the challenges? Um, I did it by delegating. It wasn't all about me. It couldn't be a one-man show because if it was, it would fail. So finding people in the parish to help me, working with the officers of Domsey, and just creating a line of communication between both of those really allowed it to become a success. So I think, if anything, I just learned how to delegate better as a pastor as a result of having that responsibility. Uh, I remember being apprehensive as the, uh, that second Parish Life Conference drew near, never having spent uh, a great deal of time with His Eminence, certainly never having uh, hosted a Parish Life Conference, and uh, really <clears throat> desiring that the conference would be, um, would, be a, uh, would meet His expectations and would be a blessing uh, to all. Due to the hard work, very hard work of many, many people from both churches, uh, the conference conference was enjoyed by all, including His Eminence, Metropolitan Philip. Uh, one pleasant surprise for me uh, during that week was the amount of time that Father David and I were blessed to spend with uh, His Eminence. Uh, he made it clear that he wanted us to be with him not only for the events and meetings of the Parish Life Conference, but also for uh, much of the downtime in the evenings. So we discussed uh, many different topics uh, and even watched a little baseball on TV. That was great, a lot of fun. Uh, it was a great week. He made it clear to Father David and me that he wanted the Diocese of Miami and the Southeast to become a vibrant fellowship uh, within the Antiochian Archdiocese. The only person that we can really turn to for any sort of, of assistance is our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. and so. The most important thing that we can remember is his unbending, unflinching love for us and the great lengths that he went in order to um, ensure that everything that is evil and everything that, that is wrong and chaotic in our life ultimately has its destruction uh, in the victory of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And oftentimes we experience that in the tough times through the community of the church because the, the church is the body of Christ. And so we experience it locally with the fulfillment of, of the body of Christ and the people that the Lord has placed in our midst in our local communities. 
but also in the wider community of the church, in the archdiocese, and of course, including in our own diocese, which is a very strong group of faithful people who are always willing to encourage one another and to continue to come to each other's aid uh, whenever there is a crisis. So when times are tough, we turn to Christ, and he often fulfills uh, what we are needing uh, through his body, the church, locally, and of course, throughout the entire diocese as well. We have to encourage each other to fight the good fight, to run the race, to finish the course, but we cannot do it alone. To be sure, we live in, a, in perilous times. Um, this reality has always been faced by Christians by placing their faith and their trust in God and His goodness and persevering. And when I find myself in situations that seem overwhelming, I try to let the energy of whatever is tempting me to be anxious and faint-hearted to drive me right back to our Lord. To exercise what little faith I have in this way joins my sufferings to the sufferings of Christ. And He is not indifferent to our suffering. He has suffered everything we can imagine, plus much, much that we can't imagine. In this way, our suffering can and will be redemptive for our salvation. As St. Paul put it, uh, we are perplexed, yet not despairing. Um, in this way, we bend our neck uh, to the will of God. Uh, as our Lord said in Gethsemane, not my will, but thy will be done. Uh, the one who made me out of nothing and suffered and died on the precious and life-giving cross is trustworthy. He can be trusted. I think we've been taught by a lot of American Christianity, even in the Orthodox Church this has affected us, where we think about faith as being primarily about something we think or do with our head, right? And so we think about faith in terms of, well, I believe this is true, so I put true on the true-false test to this. And then we think about having doubts as, well, is that really true? And that's because we have, I think, a wrong idea of what, what faith is. If we're talking about the scriptures, particularly in the New Testament, but this is true of the Old Testament also, the word that we usually translate as faith or belief or believing uh, is really more like faithful. Uh, it really includes not just something we do with our minds, but, but what we do with our bodies, what we do with our lives, uh, what we do with our actions, being faithful to God. And St. Paul in his epistle to the Hebrews tells us that that faithfulness is the substance of the things that we hope for. And so the way we think about faith is really more like hope a lot of the time. We have this hope, you know, we have a hope for the future in Christ, uh, both in this life and in the life to come. And sometimes when things get hard, we start to doubt that hope. But the way for that hope to be made real to us is through that faithfulness, through continuing to practice that faithfulness. Because it's when we go out and we're loving others and showing love to others, not just an emotional feeling, but actually doing things that show and express our love for them and caring for others. When we're doing those things, then our hope in Christ becomes very real to us, becomes very palpable. And when that happens, uh, not only is it... Uh, is it not as easy to start to doubt that hope, but it actually becomes hard to doubt that hope. It can become so real to us uh, when we're really experiencing the love and the joy and the peace that come in Christ that doubting, doubting our hope in Christ, doubting uh, the reality of Christ is like doubting that the sky is blue or doubting that the sun is going to come up tomorrow morning. Uh, and so that's when, when times get hard and we're struggling and doubting that hope, uh, the, way to, the way to keep going and the way to get through is really to double down on those things that we know God has called us to do, in, in both in worship, in prayer, in serving and helping others. And that will help make our hope and the reality of, of the risen Christ really real again for us. Well, I learned this, that when times get tough, double down your prayers for other people. 
Because if you can pray for other people when you're going through a rough time, you will see those prayers get answered fast. And when you see your prayers get answered fast for other people, and sometimes in powerful ways, what you realize is, well, God must be hearing my prayers too, because we tend to think when our prayers don't get answered that, that well, we think all sorts of things. But if he answers your prayers for other people, you know he hears your prayers too. If your prayers for what you need are not being answered right away, there might be a reason why you're going through the tough time. So if you see him listening on behalf of other people in the prayers that you pray, but your prayers are not getting answered that fast, then maybe the reason is you're going through the tough time to learn something that you need to learn and it gives you confidence and it gives you patience. The goal is to lead our people no matter how difficult times we go through to their salvation. To tell you the truth I always seek the help from our mother the Theodorus because it's it's not an easy task to be a Huri. The most important thing is uh, to be the figure of a father, of a true father, you know, uh, to my parishioners. When you receive the lamb from the bishop, you know, he says, protect it until the last breath in your life. So there is no doubt there is some ups and downs, but the reward of the priesthood is from God. As Christians, we have to be imitator of Christ and nobody else. He's our goal and he's the only one we have to look up to and nobody else. And what we do for our churches, we do it for His grace, not for us. We're doing it for Him, for His glory, not our glory. So this is my advice to everybody who works in the church. Being a clergy, we always hold unto our, unto our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ because our priesthood is coming from him. He is the high priesthood. We are just his reflection. We are the can do it for his grace into the people. So without having that faith, I cannot function. Um, faith kept me going in many difficult times because I always had to go back and remember, said our Lord word, he said, there is no disciples greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. So when if at the time is difficult, I remember what is my suffering in comparison to what our Lord had to endure for our sake and for, for our salvation. I feel myself very little. And that faith and that idea kept me going and keep preaching. And um, with because our Lord also, I remember what he said, learn from me I am meek and humble at heart so this is meekness that we learn from our Lord and, and the humility will make us keep us going our faith is the one that's the fuel for us to continue to be alive by, by our faith and to pass it to others by sticking by holding on to our faith will be a good example for other people to hold also onto their faith so without faith, we cannot fun I cannot function. And I don't think anybody can function. You have to have faith in something to go for it, to have a force for it. And um, uh, it has to be here, connection between you and your Lord. You have to build this connection, this relationship. Without relationship with, with your God, you will be lost in this world very easily. And we can, can be distracted as a Christian but we should not lose focus on the target which our Lord and Savior and Savior Jesus Christ and have faith in Him that He can, if He leads us to it, He can lead us through it. What keeps me going is that 
twice weekly encounter with Jesus Christ and the divine liturgy, that knowledge that Jesus is real, Jesus is there. That's why I don't ever sit and think about the second coming of Christ because I feel Christ is here now. So I'm not looking for a second coming. I believe that Christ is with us now. And that is what we want to get across to people, not only in this diocese, not only in this country, but in this world. And that is why a lot of you who call themselves Christians have fallen away. Because I think there's a follow-up question. He says, why have you chosen to stay active and present in the church when so many have fallen away? They fell away because we never had them. They never really encountered Jesus. They encountered something, but they didn't encounter Jesus. That's like the story of that. And I'm not going to go through the whole parable of the seeds. Okay, seeds fall on many types of ground, but when it falls on that good ground, that ground that is yearning for a relationship with God, and not just a, a mental relationship. That's why orthodoxy, one thing that's so beautiful about orthodoxy, it encounters, in, it in, brings in all the senses, so that when we receive Holy Communion, we receive, we know that we are drinking the blood of Christ, we are eating the flesh of Christ, and why that is so important? Because Christ becomes not only spiritually, but physically, part of us. Because what orthodoxy has to offer is what American culture needs. And when I see Doxy grow, and I see that this awareness broaden, and I see the efforts that are being brought, to, formulated, brought into place, created, you know, to actually do this both for our own salvation, but the salvation of others. We're on a journey together. Uh, we should have a common desire, and destination we're seeking the kingdom of God and eternal life when we gather as a diocese we have the opportunity to encourage one another and to renew our faith in Christ God knows that we need each other and that we should never try to do this by ourselves as long as a diocese has a whole remembers that we're not islands into ourselves that each church needs each other and we want to see our diocese as being a family of parishes, but a family of people. People who we related to, people who we knew, who loved us and who we loved each other, served together and suffered together. And in those early days and some of those PLCs, we'd get together and it was just like a big family. I hope that'll continue. I have to say that I think the most wonderful thing is when we have the opportunity to serve together with our clergy and laity from across the diocese. It is a wonderful thing for us to get together for ordinations or for parish uh, life conferences or other diocesan events. We can all gather around our bishop and worship together as brothers and sisters and know that we are part of one big Domsey family. And if we can just strive to be together to share our lives together, to see ourselves as brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, let's don't ever let that uh, get away from us as the body of Christ. The future is bright, Domsey, as we continue our way to glorify God. This pandemic shall pass too. And as long as we are working on increasing our spirituality through the orthodox purpose of life, becoming godlike, our future is bright, and we have all the reasons to be ecstatically optimistic for decades to come. Why am I so optimistic? Well, even in the middle of this pandemic, God deemed it important for Domsey to start a new mission in Concord, North Carolina. Through His grace, this effort is reaching fruition and this mission is the 41st parish of the diocese so god willing this growth and hope in a bright future will even continue until the second coming of our lord and god and savior jesus christ god bless you and that indicates that there's a thirst for community and there's a thirst for for being together in christ and I think as long as we keep that thirst, as long as we keep that desire burning within us, the, the sky is the limit, as they say. We need for the future a people that are holy. Not so much a people that are active, although activity is a good thing. Not so much a 
people that are regular in attendance, although that is a good thing too, but we need a church that has people that are holy, that understand what it means to be obedient and repentant. And if that happens, then I think there will be a people in our parishes that are humble and loving of not only God with their whole mind and heart and soul, but of their neighbor as themselves. As the church offers us a great tradition from the cry from Christ to the apostles, the fathers, and all those who come before us, we need to study and we need to pass on to our young people. Learn the history. Learn, read, appreciate the lives of the saints, the church fathers, and not only the ancient church fathers, but those who have come in more recent years and generations who have so much to say, like St. Raphael of Brooklyn, for example, to study and to learn from their wisdom. Also, I would say very emphatically that the younger people, and I'm saying to the young adults, as well as the teens and the children, to honor those who are elderly among us in all the parishes, to respect the traditions that they've held, to listen to their stories, to talk with them. So much can be learned from those who have had years and years of experience, trials, tribulations, and good, good times, victories. Listen to the elderly. Listen to those who've been down the road. We've been at St. Ignatius since 1987, so we've watched it grow from, from a little tiny church all the way up to where we are today. And right now we have a young bishop, a young priest, and 30% of our congregation, over 100 people are under the age of 21. So I have, I have really great hope of where this church is and where it's going. Um, I think a foundation has been laid. Now we've just got to learn how to pass it on to the next generation. So that's what I'm, that is my hope and my wisdom is that they, our young people will learn how to pass it on to their kids. If you are a good steward, then you are, you are going to be a light to pass it to others. Because we are a steward of the mystery of God, as St. Paul said, we are, we are stewards of the mystery of God. And therefore, we are to pass it to other people. So if you are a good steward, you will be a light and your light will shine and then you pass it to the next generation. Um, so therefore the wisdom is to be a good steward meaning to be a good Christian, to be a faithful. And if you are a faithful person holding into your faith, people they can see the light of Christ in you without having to do extra effort, your light is passing to the next generations. People, they need to see people who are serious about something that they believe seriously in, so they can believe them. If you go to any person, any profession, if you don't see in them that they are really understand what they do and they believe in it, you don't take them seriously. So as a Christian, if we don't take our faith seriously, then who can take it? How are we going to be impacting people if we don't ourselves uh, uh, do it before them? So that's why I think the wisdom is you have to be a good Christian to hold on to your faith. Whatever God, whatever gift God has given you, you have to be good steward of it. You have to multiply it and give it back to our Lord. And then by doing that, we can be the light of a Christ in the world. Having in mind that when we spread the light, need to remember it is not our light. We are just like a mirror, reflecting this light to others. But also, we are not just a reflection to that light. We'll be like a plant. The plants also take absorb the light and make them change, make them grow. And this is when we have that light, like those a plant, we grow from inside. And then we, that, when we grow from inside, we can, people, they see the beauty of God in us. 
And we need to, after all that, when you're growing inside and becoming spiritual, we need to remember, said our Lord, He said, You are the light of the world. And He said also, Let your light shine before men, so they might see your good works, and then glorify your Father who is in heaven. So when we do good works, when we reflect the light, we need to remember this is the light of God, and that the glory is to be to Him. The meaning, when we do good things, is not for our own glory. It should be for the glory of God. And um, I think this is, I mean, we can, uh, we need just to keep ourselves in check and to keep our faith. And I think in this way, by doing that, by being serious in our faith and take it seriously, we can pass the light to other people. Because they will, the people, it is, there is saying, uh, it is, um, it does say it is easy for your children to follow your footsteps or to your children they would follow your footsteps more they can follow your instructions meaning when you you they when you teach them by example so a good example then they can follow our our children uh, very easy they will follow our footsteps more than our word and instructions because they say, if we tell them something and we do something else, say, well, this is, uh, if, it, if he cannot do it, if it's good for him to do that, then it's good for, to, for me to do it. Therefore, if we do good things, we are give them an example and will be a good role model. Live the church. Live the church. Live the love of God. St. Sarah Kinsarov said, if you save yourself, you'll save a thousand others. We're not looking for a thousand. Save yourself through Jesus Christ. Help your family to come more to Jesus Christ. Don't make choice something that is obligatory because of what the community says or what this group or that group. Make it obligatory because I need to be there. I need to have that liturgy. I need to have that communion with my God. It is what keeps me going. It is what keeps me alive. The future holds, I would hope, a one united American Orthodox jurisdiction in the United States. A pan-Orthodox and pan-ethnic church that accepts all people and does not have a particular ethnic bias and that uh, is a church that does all of its services totally in English, at least most of the time. I think also that in the future of the church, thinking about the future of the church, I would like to see, and I think this will happen, that we will begin to develop Orthodox schools a very critical need in the United States is for us to educate our children, uh, not just on a church uh, or a church school on Sunday, but all during the week. And uh, church school, uh, Orthodox church school, is a way to do that. And I think we'll see that uh, in in the future of, of our of our diocese and in the future of our of our church. I also think that we're going to see in the future mission development. And it's what I would certainly like to see as former missions director. Many missions started, and those starts being preferable to uh, with being started by a local parish, so that the relationship between the mission and the local parish is one of mother to daughter. And the support that comes with that is amazing for the mission and allows the mission to grow in a much more um, healthy and vigorous way. So hopefully the those coming along behind us will accept change and will face the changes that come always with an understanding and appreciation of the past and what has been good. Paul does say forget what lies behind and press on to what lies ahead, but he doesn't say forget the good things to build, as Paul said, on the foundation that was laid before us. And that's what we hope will take place in the days ahead. The holy tradition and the liturgics of our church, they ought to remain the same. It's the organizations and the programs that I think we need to spend more time thinking, how do they fit the people and do they fit the people? What are the needs of our people? And then develop programs to fit that need. I would want to quote uh, from St. Paul's letter to the Hebrews when he said, Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every sin and every weight 
that so easily entangles us and run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking to Jesus, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. That's what our young people need to do. Recognize that we're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, those who've gone before us, whom we honor and commemorate and respect and continue in that pathway. We will always live in the future and we should always plan for the future and that future is bright if it is based in Jesus Christ. We let our light shine that they can see and fall. Otherwise, you know, if we don't be the example, there will be no inheritance. May God uh, bless this parish and may God bless the entire diocese of Miami in the Southeast. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you and God bless you. All the best for our diocese and we love you all. May God continue to bless you. Thank you. God bless you and may God continue to bless and inspire all of our diocese. God bless you and your families and I uh, look forward to hopefully once we're able to get together in person again for our diocese and activities uh, to uh, meeting a lot of people who I haven't gotten to meet yet and getting to know the people who I have met uh, even better. Thank you. Thank you and may God bless this diocese as it moves forward. May God bless His Grace Bishop Nicholas as he continues to lead us into the future, and may God bless each and every one of you. Groovy, God bless you. The blessings of the Lord and His mercy be with you this day and forevermore. Thank you, Dom C, for watching the Bless Thine Inheritance video, and God bless you all. O Lord, save thy people and bless thine inheritance, granting to thy people victory over all their enemies. And by the Oh.